Hello, Melanie. Great to chat. How are you going? Hi, Marty. Good. How about you? Yeah, good. We, um, you interviewed me recently <laughs> and uh, completely blew my brain and, and went down a whole lot of rabbit holes that were completely fascinating. And oh, yeah, I really enjoyed listening to all your podcasts and how you just get your head around it and ask really, really probing questions that shows you really get this stuff. And um, I suppose like you look at your bio and your background and we're just talking, you're a, you're an actress who got into biohacking and podcasting and it's just incredible what you've done. How did you go from being an actress and you said your, your first passion is still you know, TV and, and acting to, uh, to having a, a biohacking podcast? What was your motivation to, to dig that deep into all this stuff? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, <laughs> and you don't, I don't think you know this, but we're actually airing your episode very soon. Oh, wow. That so, was so much fun. So much I know. Fun. Uh, like I said, um, nobody else has quite gone to that level of detail and went, wow, you've really thought this through and understand what I'm on about, which is such a big thrill for someone to read something, let alone understand it and really reinterpret it, which is what you do really well. Thank you. And I could echo like everything you just said about me, I echo back to you. So, so this is a good moment. Um, okay, we'll stop. Just like oh gosh, stop each other. Um, the question was, uh, how did you get here? Right, it all started when. Yes. Um, so we were just talking about this before, but acting and entertainment and film really—it's re like that's really my passion. Like. I went to USC for film school and theater, and I love movies and Disney and magic and creating whole worlds. Um, but then I sort of like fell into the rabbit hole of health and nutrition because I found things that worked so well, like intermittent fasting and <laughs> the paleo diet. Um, and honestly, I just got like people would ask me questions about because I was doing fasting like 10 years ago when people weren't it wasn't popular like it is right now. Um, so I would get questions about it all the time. And I was like, I just need to like write everything down into a book so that I can just be like, here, <laughs> here are all the answers. Um, we'll be done with this and get back to acting. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I self-published a book and then that led to my new book. And then I had some health challenges and that led me into just like reading and researching even more everything I could with health and fitness. And it all just evolved into an obsession because I was trying different things to make, hopefully make me feel better. Mm -hmm. um, and then not only did things help, but then also I realized there are really amazing things to integrate into my life in general, mm -hmm. biohacking mm -hmm. things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, biohacking, what it, we'll talk yeah. about. What that um, and then I'm just like a teller. So whenever I experience something amazing, I just, I have to tell, I just have to tell people, um, to share it. I just have to tell people and what better way to do that than with podcasts. So yeah, yeah. everything just kind of, here we are. So started a podcast <laughs> and it kept going. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think when you first contacted me, I, I mentioned something about imposter syndrome, which is like, a, I'm just an engineer had some thoughts about nutrition and started to get them out there and the ball got rolling and, and here I am and chatting to you and which has been a complete blast. What's your journey? And I think you said you're not quite there and it's still a journey, but how do you get over that imposter syndrome? When did you realize, wow, I'm onto something that I can keep on pushing this button and people keep on listening to uh, coming on my podcast and listen to what I've got to say? If you find out the answer to that, you can tell me. Because <laughs> <laughs> You're still faking it too. Yeah, I know. I feel like a perpetual imposter. Um, I think I most feel like an imposter because, like I said, everything sort of came out of my own health challenges. So I'm like talking about health and fitness all the time, but it's it's because I'm trying to figure it out for myself. So mm -hmm. I often feel like an imposter with all of the health stuff. Um, I have a lot of challenges and struggles, and I guess the way I've dealt with that has been to just be really, really open, like mm -hmm. not, tr not try to be the perfect picture of health or anything and just be really, really honest and open with everything. Um, I think the other thing with the imposter syndrome is, well, it's probably two other things. Social media really stresses me out. <laughs> so uh, doing all of that a lot. Feels it's the only way to reach people, unfortunately, you've got to get out there and 
yeah, share your, share your life with the world. Yeah. Um, I just like selfies and all, I just, just all of it is like, I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, I think I, I think the biggest thing is talking to a lot of the guests that I talk to are all really, really incredible, amazing, mm. established authorities in their field. So I always feel, I actually, I have to feel like, I feel like I have to prove myself really quick in the conversation, like, cause I want them to take me seriously, which, mm. um, which thankfully like everybody brought on has been amazing and incredible. So I, I haven't mm. experienced backlash or anything like that, but I just personally feel a need to like, like make it known that I can communicate with them. Um, and, and you nearly overcompensate by delving so deep into the topic that you got such probing questions and you've got a really deep knowledge of the topic. And yeah, that that's um a real compliment to a guest. To go, wow, you really understood it and delved into it. So that, that, that that's really cool. Um, so in terms of nutrition, that's sort of my thing. You've obviously experimented with a ton of different extremes and hacks and you've gone from you know low carb keto to to you know plant-based and robbie and cyrus and what have you tried what worked and, and i suppose where did you end up and what have you landed on a, as a sustainable approach now sure so i definitely feel there are like moderationists and extremists because how about you are you like do, can you do moderation like oh. on the road? I've become more of a moderator. You so have. I've, I've, I've oh. gone to, gone through all the detail. I'm jealous. This, this is my interview of you, not me. But anyway, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't oh. can't stop being an interviewer. Um, no, I've I've definitely gone through all the the extreme and probably got to a point where I've accepted myself and understand like it's hard to look at something really yummy and go, I know why I want that right now. I've I've done a workout, done deadlifts, and you know that carb plus fat food looks really attractive now and i understand why i want that and sometimes it's okay to have that because it's context and eventually your brain settles down a bit more um but yeah it's it, it's interesting um you learn to accept your your own instincts a little bit more when once you understand them yeah i, I that's what i've accepted i think about me is like i i can't i can't do moderation i mean maybe i can <laughs> I don't think I can. Um, <laughs> so, um, as far as like the extremes of the diets, yeah. So the first, well, before I started doing healthy diet stuff, I was always doing like crazy diet stuff, mm. like the cookie diet and like calorie counting and just intense things. But the first, um, after I went low carb, the first crazy diet thing I did was I basically just ate chicken rotisserie chickens and coconut oil every single night for like six months. Wow. And this is way before carnivore, like, um, yeah. like that. Um, cause I realized that meat has creates no issues, like as far as like digestive issues or, right. anything. um, so that's like the, the meat extreme low carb side mm. of things I've been on. I haven't done like plant-based the vegan or anything like that, but I, it's the macros that I get extreme on. So I'm either doing mm. low carb, high fat, if high fat, but like low mm. carb, <laughs> mm. um, or high carb, low fat. Mm. And, but the, the consistent thing for a decade now has been the protein content, um, yep. and animal protein. So like lean animal protein, I eat an exuberant amount of it. And that's wow. always been the consistent, like always. And then I, the thing I change is if I'm doing low carb, then I'm upping the fats. If I do high carb, I'm do, eating massive amounts of fruit. Oh, yeah, okay. So it's not the starch, it's the fruit and the fruit. Oh yeah, starch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Starch is not yeah, you, You've been completely fascinated with uh, Robbie and Cyrus um, mastering diabetes guys, and which is fascinating. I, like, I'm seeing that, just seeing you've got the keto guys here and – the other extreme also works with a really high carb approach, but it's that middle zone that everybody, you know, lives in most of the time and, and, and they crash out on that because it's just the most hyper palatable foods. It's, it's easy to maintain a deficit on one extreme or the other, but it's that middle zone with the low protein. You've managed to jump either end. So do you intentionally 
switch from one to the other or you just sort of I, listen so to your body? Or? Yeah, so I don't intentionally switch, like plan it out. Um, but I just, and this is just for me. Oh, and I have to preface everything. Like I'm not even remotely a doctor and, <laughs> and I do crazy things. So don't do what I do, even though people do what I do. <laughs> I always want to do exactly what I do. I'm like, don't. Um, no, no, no. But yeah, so because I do intermittent fasting and I just eat one meal a day. And so it's sort of a non-negotiable for me that it's either if it's if it's high carb, it's high carb and really high carb and fruit, mm. but low fat. I don't mm. add fats. I will not have like added fats there. Mm. If I'm doing high fat, then no carbs. Um, well, the other consistency is cucumbers. So the <laughs> lots of cucumbers and lots of animal protein and then like a play around the other stuff. Um, yeah. But I think there's a magic to the two extremes. Like, mm. and, I, and I think it's why both um, work. One of, well, one of the reasons that both like mm. on the one hand, like vegan and plant, vegan and plant-based and then low carb, like that they both can like mm, carnivore yeah. on the other hand, both can work so well is I think they both create different metabolic states um, mm. and when we, when we have like a, you know, carbs and fat at the same time, it's just not, it's like mixed signals for <laughs> the yeah. fuel that we're supposed to be burning. I mean, cause you talk about all in your book about, you know, the, yeah. the different fuels and the yeah. hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, so I think it's an yeah. incredible hack. And when people ask me about like stalling, I often tell them if they're on like one of the extremes to switch to the other, mm. see, see what happens. Um, yeah, sure. usually it's people on low carb and then I, I tell them to try high carb, low fat. Yeah. We were just having a chat in our data from fasting live about potentially once people have stalled out on the low carb keto, blood sugar is really low. Try some starch or potato or rice and see if you can reboot your metabolism at that point. Cause your body eventually gets used to that. And nature never did that to us. We never had the same foods all year round. We sort of cycled from low carb you know autumn with fat and carbs and then winter with sort of a keto low carb and then summer uh, spring which is protein spring modified fast and then around to summer which is high carb and back to autumn but we never really got stuck in one but now we're just stuck in autumn all the time most of the time so you've managed to to jump between summer and winter and do you do that from a daily point of view or you know one day that's so cool. And you plan that intentionally of what you're going to do the next day? No. So I, um, well, okay, this is interesting. So I found that if I go, if I go on the, the low carb, high fat train, which yep. I actually usually just make the fat MCT oil. Yep. Um, I'm all about like, I'm all about what allows me to eat literally as like much as I want as yep. humanly possible and yep. most likely not going to gain weight from it. Um, and so the, the two, so like on the high carb or the low fat, the two different sides. So the low carb, yep. high fat side, um, MCT oil doesn't, doesn't, I don't, I don't know if it can be stored as fat. Yep. I asked Dave Asprey that when I interviewed him. Yeah, yeah. And you were talking to me about it. Has it got a higher thermic effect than normal mm -hmm. fat? It potentially like, does. I don't know. I, I don't think there's been enough looking into that, but um, yeah. Yeah. So like, cause it, um, it goes straight to the liver and gets used as energy. It doesn't go through um, the lymph system. Mm. It doesn't get like packaged. I don't think mm. into triglycerides. Like I think it, it's literally just like fuel. Yeah. Um, so when I do the low carb side of things, I, I use that. Um, when I do the high carb, and I just I actually just interviewed Dr. Robert Lustig yesterday, oh, wow. which was really exciting because I've been a fan of him for like so long. And he's um, I was gonna say for listeners, for listeners, for viewers, he's um, the <laughs> he kind of like he really hates fructose. Um, and you live on it. And I like love fructose. Yeah, that's what I, was, I was very much excited. I was just, you'll die if you eat fructose and get fat. And I know. Oh, wait up. <laughs> he like hates fructose, but. I don't know. I feel like the fructose, there's a difference between the high fructose corn syrup and um, like fruit. Yeah. Um, well, but I well, like drilled. In the context of a, 
a high, uh, an excess calorie diet when you've got fructose on the top of every, all the other stuff you, you're eating um you probably just end up storing that as fat in your liver but you you're you're doing fine because you're in an energy deficit potentially all the, most of the time yeah yeah that and so and this is what i was asking him um because i've i love okay one of my favorite genre of studies to read is the overfeeding studies yeah. and what happens and um when they like all of the studies that I read on carbohydrate overfeeding, when it's all from carbs, you just it's you don't they don't really gain weight from the actual carbs. Mm -hmm. Like even when it's like thousands of calories extra from carbs, the the maximum conversion to fat mm -hmm. is not that much. And so that's what I was asking him about. Like when people are gaining weight from car overeating carbs, is it yeah. is any of it actually from the carbs? Yeah, um, de novo lipogenesis is really hard to do. It's usually the fat that gets stored and the carbs get burnt off and the carbs actually have a slightly higher thermic effect of food compared to the, the fat. Protein's the best. So what you're doing with the, the really high protein is really high thermic effect of food. So it's burning off all that energy from protein and then you get the MCT oil or coconut oil, which is potentially higher thermic effect than normal fat as well so yeah yeah and, and, and you you found um the drinking man's diet before you realized it was the drinking man's oh, diet so i wrote a book on that i know was that the stephen gundry interview when... yeah yeah oh well, I, I saw the book before but oh, uh, you saw, yeah. yeah yeah i didn't even know that was like a thing i was like that's what i was doing yeah because the because the, after i stopped the coconut oil chicken i kind of trans i transitioned to pro to chicken and alcohol well, well like chicken <laughs> <laughs> what could go wrong yeah no, no I, I remember literally thinking about this this was before i thought about this at all but i was like looking through everything and i was like okay what does not become fat like alcohol yep. does not become fat no. and then but well fat easily becomes fat despite what people think <laughs> um carbs you know can be converted uh but protein is you know much of it yep. doesn't doesn't become fat, fat. So yeah. I was like, I can just eat chicken breasts and drink wine and yeah. uh, <laughs> And I think I think I was saying to you, my um my wife tolerates alcohol really well. I've got a low alcohol tolerance, so that's probably not the diet for me, but uh, I end up feeling like uh, the next day. But uh yeah, but uh, and again that the the alcohol's got a really high thermic effect of food and potentially high satiety per calorie from what we've analyzed and um so you can see how to be quite satiating combined with the protein if you're not adding fat and carbs the other two macros you're gonna be it's gonna be quite satiating and if your liver can tolerate it i suppose and <laughs> go, go, go. No, I, i'm not i want to be <laughs> again not advocating oh. that for the approach i'm not although i took a um a food sensitive no 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 a genetic report yeah that showed me my food sensitivities and um literally everything it was testing for i was in the red so like like wow. carbs. I don't know what else was testing. I, I know there was a lot of carbs. There was a lot of like plants, like lectins, all these different things. And it was like red, 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 red. And then it was like alcohol. And it was like green. <laughs> <laughs> I found my food. <laughs> I knew this. I knew this all along. That's um, great. Not endorsing yeah. them. Please don't just drink wine and eat chicken. So, so you've definitely got some high um, intolerances, autoimmune that you've had to really fine tune your diet to avoid those things that you don't tolerate well. I do, so the thing about autoimmune is I don't test for the markers, but I've been on an autoimmune diet for so long. Right. I don't You're not inflamed to those yeah. foods anymore. So I feel like I would be an autoimmune intense yeah. if I was not doing what I'm doing. Um, yeah. But it works. I love, I love what I eat. Yeah. So. That's so cool. So the, what do you, do you identify with a camp now? You've, you've moved beyond dietary camps and uh, carbs versus fat versus plant-based versus paleo. Well, I will say I, the whole dietary wars thing drives me crazy. We could all just be friends. And I realize that, <laughs> that, a lot of, that they all can work and they all, well, that's a blanket statement. I think most of them can work and most of them can work for some people sometimes some can work for some people all the time but like there's just a lot um i still i still like paleo i know that people don't 
I know it's like not as favorable of a term for some reason, but um, I, I just want to eat the foods that we ate yeah. during that time. So paleo. Yeah, and it makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, I think a lot of biohacking, a lot of the biohacking that works is something that returns you to the way we would have lived before technology, using technology to reverse the effects of technology in a lot of ways. So um, good segue to what is biohacking? It's, it's, a, it's a trigger word for some people, but um, you've got a, a biohacking podcast. And uh, what does biohacking mean for you? And I think the follow-up question, is, is there a free lunch in biology? Can we hack our biology that doesn't have a flow-on effect that, you know, you have to pay it back in the long term? Like you can take nootropics for forever but some of them have payback effects and you get tired or, or whatever you know uh, how do you how do you how do you balance the, the short-term boost versus the long-term and which biohacks work i suppose is the ultimate question yeah so the the whole biohacking people get into heated debates about like what is biohacking um I, what i think biohacking is <laughs> And it doesn't doesn't really matter to me if people think it's different. Um, but I feel like it is like tools and t things we do and technology that um, like upgrades and enhances our performance and our experience mm -hmm. of life. I think that we wouldn't normally have access to just like walking outside because some people will say biohacking is intermittent fasting or biohacking is going outside in the cold like that it but I don't I don't really think that that's biohacking I see it as like supplements and technology mm. and blue mm. light and glasses and so yeah so things that we that have we've got we have have come about from technology that upgrade and enhance our life um mm. so blue light yeah like blue light blocking glasses and cryotherapy yeah. and some supplements and yeah. All neuro and all of these different things. Yeah. My chili pad. Um, so, and then the question, oh, so like a free lunch. Um, so I think, okay, this is such a good question. I think there are a lot of things that like biohacking things that um, create a lot of good health benefits, but you, you would not be able to do them for a long time because they would kill you. Like, <laughs> um, so like cryotherapy, for example, like cold exposure, um, really, really, really amazing. But it, I mean, it's got it. It's got a cap on it. I mean, unless you're warm off, but <laughs> it seems like he can just like go forever and ever and ever. Um, but like they, they like those things tap out. So, but I think they tap out on an acute timeline, but then mm -hmm. I think you can do them perpetually. So like I could go do cryotherapy every day, but just for a few minutes of, yeah. You know, Nick, I did it right before this. Um, oh, cool. I love it. Have you done it? No, no. I've done the um, the float tank, which was pretty cool. Oh, I want to do that, the sensory yeah. deprivation. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Did you have epiphanies? I've heard you just have, like, epiphanies. Oh. No? I think you've got to do it a few times. You, I've got such an active mind that you just get bored and think, what else could we be doing for this hour? But um, eventually you get to the point you get so sensory deprived that, you do start to really relax, which I think is what it's about. But um, is it an hour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really I need cool. to... and it's all like magnesium and, and salt, and yeah, it's, it's um, very therapeutic as far as the minerals absorbed into your body as well. But um, that's pretty cool. You should I do, need that again. To do that. Yeah, I need to do that. Um, so yeah, so things like well, that that I don't know if that would have a cap on it, but things like the cold exposure or fasting, even or um, yeah, they, they kind of have a time and they, they have an end to them in a session, mm -hmm. but you could just keep doing them. Um, yeah. so things like, cause what was the example you used of like supplement or like nootropics supplements? Yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose what I was thinking is from like, from a cold exposure, we would have, we live in air conditioning all the time these days and it's all very 21 degrees or whatever, the same temperature all the time, but in, winter we would have been forced in the uh, in, in the seasonal cycles we would have been forced into those seasonal extremes and you're sort of forcing that you bring the the evolutionary biology back into your modern life with modern technology that you don't get and 
Same with efflux in your computer or your blue blocking glasses. You're sort of forcing an evolutionary biology that we've used technology to get away from and then you sort of bring it back in a beneficial way, in a calculated way and maybe in an extreme way over a short period to compensate for the fact that you're not getting the rest of your life if there's no cold exposure or whatever. So that's sort of how I sort of think of of biohacking in a, in, in a way that um, that is cool. No, that's that's the same way I think about it. Like mm-hmm. we're, because we can't, well, we could, but because we don't live, you mm-hmm. know, according to the sun and the mm-hmm. way we would in nature, like physical activity and all of that, it's ways to return us to that. Like, so this is a bad example because it's evening right now and I have on a really bright light and bad idea. But um, like once this is over, light off, I'll put on my blue light blocking glasses, I'll turn on my juve red light, like ever, I, I, and it very quickly, you can see my juve in the background, one of them, um, okay. it very quickly like sets my yeah. body and brain into thinking that it, well, it will be later, but into like getting in sync. And then when I sleep, you know, like the blackout curtains and the, like the remedy sleep mask and my chili pad to regulate my sleep temperature. So yeah, it is, it's what you said. It's That's making it more evolutionarily um, yeah. appropriate. Yeah. And I'll put on the blue blocking glasses when I go to bed and I'll still read on the phone, but the phone's got the dimmer and the computer's got the mm-hmm. F-lux to take out the blue light. And um, yeah, and it's sort of a way of, making sure you sleep well and everything but um w- when i threw out this um the idea of doing this chat with you in, in your group everybody said i want to know how she does it all in a day you know i how does she do this that and the other and and i suppose i've been through i was a, a big fan of of asprey and followed all his biohacks and uh, somewhat cynical of, of asprey to an extent and he's a bit of a salesman but um how do you like what have you tried what worked um what do you continue to use that you that you love that works really well and how do you how do you i suppose there must be a culling that even if you live a lot of your life that um this is your thing and you love doing it you can't fit in everything you've learned about in one day realistically without going insane so how what are your favorite biohacks that you do all the time yeah, no, that's a great question. And um, it's definitely been a huge journey because, well, when I first tapped into it, I was like, oh, I want to do all the things and I have to do them perfectly. Everything all at once. Yeah. And like, and I thought I had to do it like every day and everything perfectly. And um, I think I got, I got, and I'm a perfectionist, so the perfectionist tendencies didn't help. Um, and I had to step back and realize that, so the, the things that the biohacks that really, really make a difference in my life. I have just naturally integrated them into my, mm-hmm. like they become non-negotiables yep. and I like, don't even have to think about them. So it's cause I know, I think people can get overwhelmed with mm-hmm. like, what to do or when to do or how much to do. So there are some things that I, I just do every day, every night. And I, I don't even have to think about it. It's just become a part of my life so much. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that would be, um, like the blue light blocking glasses at night, for sure. The the juve, the red light therapy. I usually just have that running twenty four seven, actually, because it makes me really happy. Um, like my, you, I don't know if you can't see it. Uh, my infrared sauna. I um, I do that most nights when I have time, and um, that's something that I can like do work in. So I like can read and research while I'm in it. And that just and, makes and me the sauna sort of gives you an extreme temperature on the positive end, heats you up and makes you, I suppose, yeah. metabolism. Right. It's, it's, it. it's that thing that, um, sorry, am I pointing to it? That, that like oh, cool. coffin looking thing. Uh, <laughs> I like lay inside of it. Um, wow. But oh, yeah. yeah. It's like a couch. <laughs> That one, cool. Well, there was a couch and then there, it's behind it. Okay. Um, but yeah, so it, like you just said, it uses infrared energy to heat you up from the inside out. So you reach high body temperatures without having to actually, rather, it doesn't heat you from the outside in, which makes you feel really hot in a traditional sauna. So you get hot, you get warm, but you don't feel like, like you don't feel super hot. Yeah. Um, 
but it still has all the health benefits and potentially more so. Um, so like that's something I do every night that I can, but I don't do it because I feel like I have to, I do, I do, I do it because I want to, I think that was a big transition was from feeling like I have to do these things to feeling like I want to do these things. Mm. And, um, you love doing them cause they're just things you love doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and now I get people send me products like every, I mean, <laughs> like so many things, so many things. Um, and that's actually helped. Like at first it was overwhelming, but yep. now it's helped because there's just so much, there's no way I could mm. be doing all of it all the time. So I just try the things and if they're really amazing, I keep them in and I tell listeners. <laughs> <laughs> share, share the love with the world. Yeah. Uh, that's great. What a, what a fun gig. What a fun job. Um, yeah. yeah. I see the, the, the take a breathing to do the, the breathing technique and the heart rate variability and, and um, I had an aura ring until I lost it. Like yours, no, you're which the, was unfortunate. Yours got stolen. You said, well, it, it was on my desk at work and there was this little girl that, came in for the day with the dad to I think she went well that's pretty I might try that on and walked away with it I think that's what happened to it so it's very sad because they're not cheap but um but some of those things I think like from a lizard brain I always bring it back to the um uh, your lizard brain is you have to train it slowly and if you try to make force too many things all at once it just you know, rebels and says, I can't do all these things at once. So that's where you've just added one thing at a time and some things have become part of your life. And for me, some things have become part of my life and I've just learned to do that. And now I can sort of lay in bed and just breathe and relax and chill out and I can just zone out and find a space that's really refreshing without having to use the app necessarily. So I suppose you find that balance. Is there anything you've found that you've gone... I've got to discard this. I can't, you know, I can't, I can only have so many buy hacks in my day and I need to ditch this one and this one and this one. Yeah. Um, well, I, I definitely reached supplement fatigue like way, way. So, <laughs> I, cause I, cause the, I, on, so the first, when I first got my health issues, which they started with digestive issues. So when those first started, like, I thought the answer was in supplements or some supplements. So I went, I was like going, trying so many supplements and like making all these notes and it was really, really upsetting. Um, so now I'm very much a minimalist with supplements. Mm. I I'd said I was never going to develop a supplement for this reason, but I actually do think there's one I want to develop, but it's, it's one of the only ones that I've taken. I haven't stopped taking ever. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so supplements and then, um, I'm embarrassed to say this. Okay, so I I want to be a meditator so bad. Um, and when I've done – so like I did Emily Fletcher's Stress Less, Accomplish More, and I had her on the show. And it was amazing when I did the, the program. Mm. And a lot of it really like stuck with me. But I haven't been able to – do it like every single day. I find that when I do it, I get really stressed about doing it. Like I feel wow. like, I mean, it helps so much after, but like penciling it in, um, I don't know. So there's like, there's like three different meditation companies who are sending me stuff. So I'm going to try all of theirs. Um, but I'm still looking for the, like they're sending me what, something that's like a, something that you hold that, that's coming in the mail soon. So I'm going to try. Uh, what, what, what does the Apollo Neuro do for you? Oh, I love the Apollo Neuro. Um, that was something that I used. That. You haven't tried it? No. Um, 100% I endorse it. Um, it's something that I, when I first got it, this is a good example of a biohack where your use may vary based on how you are at any present moment compared to like blue light blocking glasses where I'm going to use those every night. I think the things that deal with stress um, so the Apollo Neuro, it's a, for listeners, it's a, a wrist device that uses sound wave therapy. So gentle vibrations to instantly activate your parasympathetic nervous system. So your rest, your rest and digest state, your relaxation. Um, I've, I, it, it's been incredible for me that the sleep it has like a sleep program it has different programs, yeah. but 
the sleep program was a game changer for me with insomnia. And I don't, I don't, now I just, when I first got it, I was using it like all during the day at night while sleeping. And then as things got better and better, now I pretty much just use it at night, not every night, just some nights. I feel like I would like to use it with the relax wind down mode. Um, So that's an example of something where depending on your personal stress state, you might need it more or less. Um, Mm. So everybody I've introduced to it or people, people just tell me all the time how amazing it is. Yeah. That's something that might be a free lunch and that I don't think you can overdo it. Like I don't think it would have any negatives. Yeah. So, so when you talk to Asprey, he, I think at the end of the interview, he warned you to not overdo it. Is there a, you know, he's obviously just tried to biohack everything and you hear him talking about taking 120 supplements a day. And I struggle to take one or two that I want to, and I've got this drawer, two drawers full of dead supplements that I bought on. I heard that I haven't actually taken, um, I don't know how many, I haven't thought of how many hundreds of dollars worth of, um, Supplements are in there. Is there a point where you try to have too many different things? Try to retrain your lizard brain, and it just explodes. Is where? Where? How do you find that balance point that you know you've pushed too far into trying too many different changes and biohacks? And I suppose when when we're designing the masterclass or data driven fasting, we're really wary that data is useful, but too much data just explodes people's brains how do you how do you guide people to find that right balance for them yeah i think you really have to know yourself and what okay let's see if i can articulate this the the connection between your personal identity and things because if you have if nothing of your if you're if nothing related to your identity is wrapped up in these things I think you could do them perpetually because you would just be looking at them as data. You wouldn't Mm. be have, you wouldn't have fear or anxiety or um, Mm. like false hopes or crushed. Like if there's no identity attached to it, I I think it's completely fine. I think the problem comes in when it becomes part of your identity. So then it becomes related to anxiety or fear or, um, things like that. So I think you have to know yourself. And, um, I think for me, I I just, I've just had to, I don't, I don't think I can ever do too many things that are working on that identity piece. So anything that's like Mm. helping me deal with stress or helping me reframe or mindset. So like meditation, Apollo neuro, maybe something like CBD, like things that are like working on my, that part of me, I, I don't think I would have to worry about overdoing because they would be helping combat the problem, which the problem that I think it's created from overdoing things, which is Mm. stress about all of them and anxiety. Um, So I think you just really have to, to know yourself and like, is tracking these things making you feel better or making you more anxious? So like for me, so things that would be like tracking constantly, um, Like CGMs, I went through an obsessive CGM period, but then I just had to stop because I was like, this is like too stressful. (laughs) Um, I have like one left that I might do again sometime. Um, But like, a lot of people find that with CGMs, it does their head in and they just go, I can't deal with all this data. But if you can just approach this data information that helps, like, I I really like that point that you said your identity is not wrapped up in that piece of data you're not feeling judged by that and with the aura ring sometimes it's like you've had a bad night's sleep you're a bad sleeper and it's like oh i'm trying yeah so or so aura was interesting because i i did so when, when did you lose yours uh it was, was a, a long time ago. ago a bit a year ago i lost it okay i do wonder because i know they've um I know they've like evolved how it like talks to you. Like when you had it, did it ever make you feel like you like, did it ever, did the messaging that it gave you, gave you make you feel like you had failed or. Uh, I just saw other people on Facebook that had better sleep skills. Than <laughs> me and I felt inadequate because that was one thing I, according to that, I couldn't master, but you know, I generally feel like I get 
enough sleep to feel refreshed and perform. So um, everybody could be a better sleeper, but, uh, you know. But I found it really helpful that it motivated me to get out and go for a walk at lunch and get more steps and be more active. And that was really cool. But yeah. That's yeah. Fun. Well, because so, I didn't get one for the longest time because I was like, this is going to make me neurotic. Like, this is gonna, like, no, no, no. I don't want it to like tell me that I slept bad. Um, but I, I found it to be like, well, I'm really sad that I, you know, just lost my second one. <laughs> um, but I found, I've actually found it to be really, I was surprised. I found it to be really encouraging. Um, like it has not contributed to my neuroticism. Yep. Um, so I, th I think probably because it understands that I'm a night owl and it doesn't try to change me about that. Yeah. Like it suggests that I go to bed at 1 30 AM. I'm like, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but I, and I asked, or, uh, Harpreet, the CEO, I asked him yeah. this about the, the sleep. Apparently I'll never be able to get like a perfect sleep score because I go to bed so late. So even though like everything can be like great with my sleep, like, like it's all great sleep because I went to bed late. It's not going to give me like a really good score. Perfect score. Okay. We're on the other end where I, it's probably because I, I go to bed early and wake up quite early and get all my stuff done early in the morning. So it's probably not going to love me as much, you know, so we can both be aura rejects. <laughs> <laughs> so what do, you, what do you reckon? Like I had someone say that, Google has not now bought Fitbit so they can track your heart rate and, you know, Google can potentially now give you search recommendations based on your stress levels and whether it thinks you may be pregnant and, you know, the amount of data out there potentially that these big data companies have got is just mind-blowing and, and really powerful if we can work out how to use it for for good um what, what are you most excited about on the horizon that we can potentially leverage technology to actually give health in the future yeah um i'm really excited okay well i have a lot of thoughts um <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure first. you do you probably have a better insight than most people um, really. the first is that I think the biggest thing I'm excited about, because I work with a company called Insight Tracker, for example, mm. and they do a lot of like personalized blood tests and um, analysis of your health status and trends and things like that. And I think the, the the most potential there is for incredible change isn't so much the, you know, I won't say isn't so much. I think one of the biggest things I'm excited about is it, the more and more tracking they do and and information that we learn and court and uh, when it becomes more clear that certain mm -hmm. dietary lifestyles correlate to disease, that maybe mm -hmm. there can be a change in like the insurance system and the medical mm -hmm. system where, you know, move potentially moving away from just the prescription system that we're at right now, treating, um, uh, not treating degenerative disease. Yeah, so because like for addressing symptoms of sickness rather mm -hmm. than actually proactively helping people. And I think a lot of people really want to know what can I do to be proactive and anybody who thinks thinks of themselves as a biohacker wants to be proactive to optimize their health proactively, which is really cool. Yeah. And um like for for example, yesterday when I was interviewing Dr. Robert Lustig, we talked about um like the roles of insurance companies and profits and health. Mm -hmm. And um, what's really interesting is there's no lab code for like metabolic syndrome, for example. So things like that are chronic there, there's no way they, it's not incentivized to treat mm -hmm. or to, you know, have be, have it be part of the healthcare system, honestly. Yeah. Um, there's no motivation for, to proactively treat metabolic syndrome will make sure you don't get to that point. It's just treating those symptoms once you get down there. But potentially the insurance companies who are motivated by not having to pay out a whole lot of money once you get to extreme metabolic syndrome with all the side effects of that will want to actually pay up front or motivate people and, like you say, incentivize people to avoid that state. So, yeah. Yeah, like if, if there could be a change where the insurance companies 
are based on if they make their money from people being healthy rather than people mm. being sick, which is like massive paradigm shift. Um, yeah. But I'm hopeful that maybe technology um, might help lead us in that direction. Um, we shall see. I am, this is oh. a, go ahead. got my Rob Wolf bottle. Oh. Element, Represent element. And a whole box of Stay Stealthy stuff over here from Rob. I have so many boxes of their electrolytes. <laughs> you can put me on some like auto ship shipment. And oh, I don't need God. as many electrolytes when I'm, because I normally am doing like a really high carb. I, I find like I need them more when I'm low carb. Low carb. Yeah. So it keeps like showing up. I'm like, oh, pause. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, when I go into my low carb like train again, I'm excited. Yeah, on, on, on the technology of the, of the future, eventually everybody's going to have a potentially a CGM on their watch and their wearable and know their blood sugar. So I, we reckon it'd be really cool if we could guide people based on the current blood sugar when they need to eat and then at that point what they need to eat exactly based on what they've eaten in the past and how high the blood sugar is. And, yeah, so that would be the ultimate for us um, using that technology, which would be really, really exciting. Yeah, that would be in the, all the CGM interviews I've done. I've asked them about that, like the future. That's something I'm excited about because the CGMs are very cost costly mm. right mm. now. And I'm excited for them to be, become more approachable. Um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be really interesting. Yeah. It'd be super cool. Um, so on supplements versus food, you're saying you've moved away from being such a supplement junkie. What have you found there? I suppose I've got a, you know, my opinion on that, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we have a, we hold a similar opinion and I, um, I think in the ideal world, we would get all of our nutrition from food, like food is new food as nutrition. <laughs> um, but then I know I just, in our modern world, I think there are, you know, mm. few nutrients that are pretty hard to get yeah, definitely. like enough of so like magnesium with our depleted soils, um, vitamin D with people not being out in the sun mm. and then certain, t I mean, it's all, we're all so individual. The, the thing about supplements, nutritional supplements that makes me mm. nervous is I, I just, I mean, I've been to so many holistic doctors and then, you know, they give me like, take these nutritional supplements or take this. I don't know how my cognitive brain like has, and I know I could do like blood tests, but like me taking supplements, thinking I know what I need compared to my body being able to intuitively extract from food, what it needs. Mm. And when it takes it from food, you don't have to worry about toxicity mm. um, with like over, you know, too much of something. Um, so my ideal world, I let my cravings tell me what, mm. what I need. Cause I, I, I eat such a simple diet. Like mm. there's really only a few types of foods I eat. And I find that my cravings, you know, very much wow. change based. And I feel like it must be a, you know, nutrient thing, like whether or not wow. I'm creating like craving chicken versus fish versus beef. Wow. Probably has something to do with the nutrients and what that. I need at that point. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's incredible. It just that that I think is the ultimate for us is to use diet driven fasting to help people to get in tune with their true hunger. And then once you eliminate all the fake food and the colors and flavors, then you get much more in tune with the nutrients that you need in food. So, like, yeah, oh, I'm craving this or I'm craving that. And you actually chase the nutrients that you need in food that are in the, the form and with the other nutrients that. Yeah, complementary nutrients, synergistic nutrients, none of them come by themselves. They all come packed together in the package that you need in the form found in nature and the right ratios and your body goes, yeah, I know what to do with that rather than bulk supplements that, uh, yeah, may or may not be absorbed in the same way. I just don't think we understand much about how supplements are actually used in our body and maybe if you've got a severe nutrient deficiency, then you need, to supplement that nutrient because you're obviously really not getting it from food but uh yeah yeah yes so like the the consistent supplements i do take are all digestive support so yeah uh, well if people yeah people are curious about what i do take it's 
digestive digestive support. So digestive enzymes and HCL, those help me so wow. much. Um, Serapeptase, which the proteolytic, it's a proteolytic enzyme from the Japanese silkworm. Are you familiar oh, wow. with it? This is, I want to make a supplement. I want to make serapeptase because I've been taking it for really so long. benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you take it in the fasted state. So it's not a nutrient. Um, take in the fasted state and it goes in your bloodstream and helps break down residual proteins. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, a lot of people find benefit from the um, betaine HCL, the uh, mm -hmm. supplemental acid in the stomach to help you actually use the protein, especially if they start to up their protein and they're not dealing well with that. A little bit of extra acid acid support is really um really helpful. Yeah, I've I've been taking a, I take I've been taking a lot of HCL for a long time, especially with the okay. exuberant amount of meat that I eat. <laughs> So how much protein do you, do you know how many grams per kilo lean body mass you're actually eating? Um, so I go through different periods, but I probably, okay. So when I was at the high end, I was eating probably about two and a half or three pounds of raw chicken, like at a time. Raw so chicken. Like, wow. Oh no, sorry. Like, no, no. Okay. Raw, you cooked but, after. Yeah, okay. yeah. You're right. Right. <laughs> um, okay. yeah. Um, right now I eat, um, I probably, I don't know, pounds of, I eat a lot of, I'm on a scallop train. I, I've been eating a lot oh, of scallops, wow. I eat like pounds of scallops every night, plus chicken or fish. It's pounds. What's are wrong with scallops? Hmm? Scallops are just incredible. Nutritionally They're, high protein. The, the reason I decided to like, go on the scallop train was I was reading a study looking at um, the glycine ratios of scallop yeah. versus chicken and people or oh, it might've been rats. I think it was people. I don't know. <laughs> it was scallops, <laughs> cod, chicken, and I think maybe one more and um, the effects on inflammation and liver enzymes and stuff like that. Insane. Like the scallops, like mm. they got rid of like all the issues. It was crazy. Yeah. And I was like, I'm doing scallops. Um, <laughs> and so, has it benefited you found it beneficial yes yeah it was um i so i switched over to like mostly scallops and they're low mercury they're one of the lowest in mercury yeah, of wow. all the seafood um yeah a lot of beneficial effects like sleep cool. inflammation my nails started growing like crazy wow. um all the blessing you'd be getting from the scallops yeah so i i do i eat pounds of them every night have you um You've obviously looked into the protein leverage hypothesis and Ted Naiman and and all that. I um I just got an email back this morning from David Rubenheimer and Steve Simpson who wrote the protein energy uh, leverage obesity paper um, about coming on for a chat, which I'm completely thrilled about. So I'm going to get Ted on with the original protein energy ratio guys, and that's going to be a whole lot of fun. But they. They did this mega mouse study, and I know you've interviewed um, David Sinclair, and he he I'm he, with him. he he wrote a paper with them on this mega mouse study about the downsides of too much protein. Have you ever looked into that in terms of longevity? And that's something I just can't get my head around because yeah, everything in human biology says don't be over fat. If you're over fat cancer, heart disease, diabetes, everything that's killing us in Western society is related to being over fat, energy toxicity. But then this mega mouse study came out and said, you know, it's the carb to protein ratio that is the thing you need to watch and more carbs and less protein. You'll be fat, but you'll live longer. But it, I don't see that in the human research. And that's the one thing that in their research and Sinclair's on the same plant-based train as well. And I, I can't get my head around that. So I'm eager to talk to them with, with Ted in my back pocket to see if we can get to the bottom of this. But I think that's one, like how do, what messaging do you take to the public when you say protein to energy ratio is the bomb, but don't eat too much protein and eat more carbs, you'll get fat, but you'll live longer because you've got this mouse study. Do you, have you... you 
you probably look, looked into this more than me. Do you, can you make your, get your head around that? I am haunted by this question. So really, yeah, there are a few things I'm haunted by. I'm haunted by the fructose debate. I'm haunted by the protein, everything that you just said. Um, <laughs> so, so, and I have thoughts. <laughs> um, so one of my really, really good friends who I had on the show, James Clement, he wrote a book called The Switch. Um, he actually studied supercentenarian populations and did a lot of blood work on them. And so his main thing has been like longevity and factors leading to longevity and so diet and all of that. And he has labs in Florida where they do ongoing research. Um, and I talk to him all the time. And um, he is, and I also really recommend that book, The Switch. It's amazing. Um, and what was I going to say? Uh, so he's at, he's very much on the low, lower protein train. Um, and I really respect him because <laughs> it's hard to find people that I feel like aren't cherry picking at all mm. when I talk to them. Mm. Um, so this is something I talk to him about a lot because he knows I'm like, you know, crazy amount of protein. Um, okay. There's so much, there's so much here. I think a low, a low protein diet, and this is what he talks about in the book. And a lot of people talk about David Sinclair and lots of people is protein obviously turns on mTOR, mm. you know, our master metabolic anabolic growth mm. pathway um proteins turning that on so it's it's the opposite it's making us grow arguably making us age <laughs> mm. um you know the opposite so a low protein diet is going to be low in mTOR um and have a lot of anti-aging benefits and longevity benefits from that i think a low protein diet in the context of whole foods. Mm. Um, so not the issues of, cause you're talking about, you're talking about like how, you know, obesity and getting fat, you know, energy mm. toxicity is the main issue here. Um, mm. I think if you are able to have low protein in a sustainable diet where you have, where you do have enough protein to support muscle mass, cause that's the other thing. And that's something Rob Wolf talks about all the time. Mm. It's like the massive issues with, you know, sarcopenia or, mm. uh, Wait, sarco sarcopenia is the, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, like the big issues with not having, you know, with muscle wasting and all of that. Mm. And we and we know that when people, I feel like I'm going all over the place, yeah. as far as the uh, protein content and health that the, so in humans, it seems that the lower protein longevity correlation is only in young people. Once you are older, I don't know if it's like, 60s, 70s, or whatever it is, then all everything goes out the window. Like higher protein is more supportive of mm. mortality, not mortality, of not dying. Good, um, <laughs> not dying, not falling over and breaking a hip and, and being a whole lot of problems from there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, my sort of thinking goes along the lines of, you know, if if you're over fat, you're having too many carbs and protein. So you need to dial that back, which increases your protein percentage. So if your waist to height ratio is over 0.5, you need to lose some fat. Um, dial back your carbs and protein, maybe a bit, uh, carbs and fat, maybe dial up the protein until you get to a point where you've got, got a healthy, um, non diabetic body composition. And then at that point, you bring back in the carbs and fat energy to support growth, uh, activity, and whatever you need. And, and like Ted Naiman's got this amazing, uh, extreme diagram and you know, everybody wants to jump from one extreme to the other but optimal is always sort of in the middle there somewhere and in terms of insulin and mTOR and all those sort of things that IGF-1 if you're at one extreme or the other you're in trouble you have to sort of find that more optimal position in the middle that is not sarcopenic and, and not morbidly obese so yeah I think that nuance is really hard to find in this discussion and between the plant-based extremes and the, you know, bodybuilder bro injecting testosterone and anabolics. And, you know, it's, it's just really hard to find that balance point with a clear messaging in the middle. Well, yeah. And to that point, um, I think there's something, well, I think when people are doing fasting and combining it with high protein, then you're getting the, the fasting mm. state, so the lower yeah. IGF-1, the mTOR off. 
So I think that's like the best of both worlds for a lot of yeah. people. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, I think if people are doing low protein, like I said, like whole foods, it, it often necessarily automatically creates a calorie deficit. Um, so mm. then they might actually be able to be not fasting, but eating, cons- you know, more, more regularly, but low protein and low calories. So maybe they're getting all of the anti-aging benefits from that without like fasting or, um, yeah. But yeah. I think when, when it comes to weight loss, it's really, really hard to argue like high protein, mm. like the thing, like the, the, you know, the PE thing, it's, it's just mm. really hard. I mean, that just works so well. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And the satiety and the nutrients and just, yeah. I'm, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of, I'm a huge fan of like really upping the protein. And yeah. then the two, like as we talked about at the beginning, the two extremes of yeah. macros, at least in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, micronutrition, nutrient density always go hand in hand with protein. If you're chasing micronutrients, you're getting protein and vice versa. So it's amazing. Um, I suppose to, to round off on fasting, have you dug into early time restricted feeding? Do you do that? It seems to be a lot of theoretical benefit of having a, a, a higher protein, more of your calories earlier in the day, but that's hard to do in reality in real life and with a family and work most of the time for most people. Have you dug into any of that research? What have you found? Yeah. So I think, Okay, I think the majority of the research on like breakfast and timing of day is not, most of it's not really applicable for the question I think you and I are asking, which is, you know, breakfast only compared to like evening only. Like mm-hmm. most of the studies are looking at either just like skipping or not skipping breakfast, or they're looking at, um, they're looking at, like the effects of dinner, but in the context of other meals, like there aren't, there aren't many like well-controlled studies on it. Mm. That said, um, I did, I, at one point I found one study and I think I talked about this for like hours on the intermittent fasting podcast, but I thought it was like really well set up and it pretty much did look at what I would want to be looking at. And it did seem to find that when everything is ridiculously controlled that yes, early time, early eating is better. Um, and practicality, and this is what you just touched on. I think what is best is what you, what works for you. And I think a lot of people just in their life, they just like, for me, I just really, I love eating late. I sleep better. Um, I don't want to eat during the day. The timing's better. Like I'm just really, really happy eating late. And I think that, um, so I wish in, in spirit, I was like an early eater because maybe it would be like a tiny bit better. But um, I think in reality, it's like practically what you can do. Yeah. And um, I think the, the, the biggest problem I think with the studies they do on all of this is they say that we, that our insulin sensitivity is reduced at night. Um, like if you eat in the evening, but that's like, that's usually thinking that's usually acting like you've been eating all day. So I think mm. that's probably usually the reason that the insulin sensitivity is off. Cause you've been eating all day. You know, they're not usually looking at just eating at night because yeah. you're super insulin sensitive if you've been fasting all day. So, yeah, yeah. And, and if you're an overall calorie deficit, you're going to be fairly insulin sensitive anyway. We, we definitely find with our analysis of the data that you're having a, 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 a protein focus first meal of the day you don't want to start your day with a croissant or donut or anything like that because you'd just be ragingly hungry later on but if you have your first meal of the day that's protein focused um, and it always works with the people in data-driven fasting you just say if your blood sugar is elevated focus on protein and not energy and they go wow satiety smashed and i'm i'm so full and i didn't binge on pizza later at night. Um, so that tends to work, but I don't think you need to have your first meal 5 a.m. or anything ridiculous. It's just, you know, if you can eat during daytime, but if you're a night owl, then that's going to be hard. But that sort of wraps around, to, you know, you can only stack so many hacks. And if you're always feeling guilty and you're going, I hate myself because I haven't ticked all the 300 boxes and taken the 120 supplements today, then... Um, it's not adding to life. So you've got to find yeah. that balance overall, haven't you? 
Yeah, I've just decided, I mean, that's, it, and it goes hand in hand with me staying up late and being a night owl. I've just like accepted it. I think one of my like favorite moments on my podcast was when I interviewed uh, Tar Youngblood. She's the founder of uh, Chili Pad that I use every night. So my cooling mattress. And she said that like her biggest thing is basically like there are different chronotypes with sleep and like some people mm. you know, are night people and that's mm. where they are. And that is completely fine. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yes. That's great. <laughs> um, Cause I am very much a night person. So are there any other magic biohacks that we haven't discussed that you love that you wanted to share with people or any other thoughts that you wanted to leave people with or any recommendations or the, the words of uh, wisdom after how many hundred interviews you've done? with some of the smartest people in the field oh i know it's crazy um, <laughs> this is your life in one sentence Go. <laughs> um honestly i will say one of the biohacks that i've recently been diving into and i talked about with dave asprey but it's the deuterium depleted water oh, wow. so that's a whole tangent it's, and that's deep that's, rabbit hole. yeah it's something it's not really affordable for people, but I'm actually doing two episodes on it in the future. So cool. that's exciting. Um, I did a deuterium depleted water protocol, which was very exciting. And I just got my results back in my, so really quick, deuterium is a heavy isotope of hydrogen yep. and it like gunks up your mitochondria and weighs you down. And people who research it think that it's like the cause of like all disease mm. because of how it affects the mitochondria. Um, so that's, that's just like a crazy random thing. Um, I think that the most important thing for me, it really always comes back to mindset. And that's why I, that's why the last question I ask every guest on my show is what, what is something that they're grateful for? Because I just think that that is so important. Like the, your, your grat gratitude and kindness and, um, I don't know, just being a nice human being, I'll take all of that over biohacking any day. So that's yeah, cool. and the engagement you get with people and seeing people thrive and it's just so rewarding and you feel like you're benefiting and adding to the world and giving something to people, which is so satisfying and something to be thankful for. Yeah, I, um, I'm almost there. I, I don't know if I'm almost there. I, so I really, I had my health challenges like they got really, really bad at points, like yeah. anemia, like in the hospital and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm almost to the point where I can say I'm completely 100% grateful for all of it because it's made me go on so. I wouldn't have the show or any mm -hmm. of this if I hadn't f had what I perceived as dire health crises, mm -hmm. <laughs> crises, whatever the plural is. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm getting there. Someday I feel like I'm going to be completely grateful for all of it. And I'm yeah. really excited for that moment. Yeah, oh, that's great. And it's definitely sent you down a rabbit hole. It's educated a lot of people and you've learned a lot and shared a lot. And you learn so much by sharing it and digging deeper and talking to all the all the gurus. And it's really exciting. Um, cool. Hey, thank you so much for doing this. It's been so much fun, such an honor. Thanks for your friendship and support and you know, listening to you and Jin rave about the book and it's like this is so embarrassing this is so lovely that uh you, you you know get it and share it and and spread the word so thank you for that too no i have to say yeah thank you your book is amazing and yeah for people who are not i talk about marty's book on the intermittent fasting podcast all the time because it's amazing i just want to thank you for like smashing all of these misconceptions that we have in the whole diet world um I really like when I read your work, it, I, I don't want to say it's what I think because I don't, I don't know anything. And like, I reserve the right to change my mind about anything, but the way you think and the things mm. that you've discovered are, is the way I think and the things that I have discovered mm. as well. Mm. And um, I just really, really thank you for everything mm. that you're doing. Yeah. Big compliment. Yeah, it's, a, it's such a massive thrill to have people you respect, appreciate your work and uh, understand it. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time, Melanie. It's been a complete rage and everything I have to be. And um, yeah. Thank, thank you, you so for much. having me. Well, I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more. <laughs> That'll be great. Thanks, mate. See ya. <laughs> Bye.